Microsoft Research brought together leaders in the exciting field of machine learning at a major summit in Paris. We are pleased to offer research and focus interviews with participants at the Microsoft Research Machine Learning Summit 2013. I'm here with Dr. Christopher Bishop of Microsoft Research Cambridge, one of the co-chairs of the Machine Learning Summit. Now that we've met, we can call each other Chris. Thanks Chris. for being here. <laughs> uh, let's start with the summit. Talk about the background and what you're hoping to accomplish. Right, so the reason we're having a summit really is because a lot of people think that the next big thing in computing is, has to do with data. So if you think about the last 40 years of computing, it's really been driven by, by Moore's law, by the fact that the number of transistors on a chip has been doubling every couple of years. Mm -hmm. And that's really driven this, this amazing uh, transformation in the world that we've seen. And what we're seeing today is something similar is happening with data. The amount of data that we're collecting and storing is kind of doubling every couple of years or so. Mm -hmm. And people think that that data and the information and the value contained in that data is gonna drive the next wave of, of the computing revolution. And I understand right out of the gates, you've got some really extraordinary keynote presentations planned. We've got some great keynotes. So we're kicking off with uh, Andrew Blake. He's uh, the director of Microsoft Research Cambridge, and he's also a, a world expert in computer vision. And the field of computer vision, the field of machine learning have really sort of come together over the last decade or so. So we're looking forward to some sort of exciting ideas about the future of vision and the impact that machine learning will have from, from Andrew. Um, then later on, we have um, Judea Pearl. Now, Judea has really pioneered um, the notion of causality, and in particular, learning causality from data. So we know that you know smoking cigarettes and, and getting lung cancer are sort of correlated with each other, but the question is, uh, does one cause the other, or does the other cause the one? Hmm. So getting causality from data is a really subtle and really hard problem, but a, 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 a tremendous potential because we now have all this data in the world we can in principle discover causal patterns from the data but it's a hard thing to do you can't just get causality purely from the data alone so we're looking forward to uh, to Judea's uh, views on, on where we go with this and uh, our final keynote speaker is Herman Hauser now he's one of the founders of ARM so he sold you know more microprocessors than there are people on the planet mm -hmm. and of course that's just the beginning we're going to see this explosion in the number of processors people talk about the internet of things you know everything from your coffee cup your wristwatch mm -hmm. we'll have a processor will be connected to the internet. So we're going to have uh, tens of billions of computers connected to the internet, all gathering and providing data. So this, this data explosion that we see today is really just the beginning. So we, you know, we're, we're keen to hear Herman's views on, uh, on what all that Internet of okay. Things is going to do and what all those processes are going to do for us. Obviously some really big topics and you have some, uh, some, some big goals for the summer, but let's talk about your work in machine learning. Uh, what are you researching? The thing I'm most interested in is a, is a kind of different view of machine learning from the one that we've had for, for most of the past, I don't know, 20 or 30 years. So machine learning has quite a long history. And a lot of traditional methods in machine learning have to do with, um, you know, you gather some input variables, things you measure, and you have some things that you want to predict. So you kind of fit a, a kind of function, a black box between them that takes the input variables and makes the predictions. And you kind of have a training phase where you tune up all the parameters so that it works mm -hmm. really well. And then you have the sort of the application phase, you provide new inputs and it, it makes predictions. And that's great. And that's going to be around for, for many years to come. And over the last 20 or 30 years, a bunch of different algorithms or techniques have been developed for solving that kind of problem. So they're very useful, they'll continue to be useful, but I'm interested in a, a different approach to machine learning. We call it model-based machine learning. So the idea is it, you've got a problem you want to solve. Instead of choosing one of those standard algorithms that you hope will solve your problem, instead you build a bespoke solution. You craft a solution that's, that's tailored to your specific application. Now it might be that that bespoke solution happens to be equivalent to one of those traditional methods, or it might be something entirely new that's never been done before. So the vision is that you have some kind of environment within which you can um, uh, create a model that is a sort of a description of the world, and or the piece of the world that you're interested in, in understanding. And that would be, that model would be described by, you know, 20, 30 lines of code, no more, some simple compact model. And you would take that model description and this, this platform, this environment would automatically generate the actual machine code that would do the machine learning on your data. So it's kind of a vision and we're sort uh -huh. of part way down the road and I'm really excited about where that might go in, in the years ahead. Now you dropped a lot there with the bespoke in, in you know the simple code. Easy for you to say. Can we take a look here at exactly what the secret sauce right, is? Right. Okay. This works? So I've got a little demonstration here, a little toy example, which illustrates um, a key concept that's going on here, which is the idea of uncertainty. So you know, computers are sort of logical things. They deal with noughts and ones, on and off. It's all kind of binary, deterministic. 
But the world of data all has to do with uncertainty, with complexity and with um, shades of grey, if you like. So this is an example of, or this demonstration illustrates the kind of mathematics that we use as a, as a way of achieving this vision of, of model-based machine learning. The basic idea is we're going to use probabilities to quantify uncertainty, to explain uncertainty. Yeah. So this little example, what it's going to do is it's going to try and recommend some movies for me to watch. So the system has already been trained on um, about 10,000 recommendations made by several thousand people on these 200 movies. All it knows is that, you know, person five liked movie 27 or something like mm -hmm. that. It doesn't know that this is an action adventure or romantic comedy. It doesn't know anything about the people themselves. It's just likes and dislikes of that set of, that set of people. We call that collaborative filtering. But it knows nothing about me, okay? So I need to tell it something. Let's say I watch a movie. Let's say I watch uh, Pretty Woman. So I'll watch Pretty Woman, and let's say I like it. So I'll drag it across into the green area to say I liked that movie. What it's done now is it's rearranged the other movies on the screen in a right. particular way. Now, the vertical position is irrelevant. They're just spread out so we can see them. The horizontal position on the screen is the, uh, the system's probability uh, that it thinks I will like that movie. So if a movie is down the right-hand side here of the white area, it's pretty sure pretty certain that I'll like that movie. If it's on the left-hand side, it's pretty sure that I won't like the movie. And in the middle, it's kind of 50-50. It just doesn't know. Okay? Wow. So what we see now is the movies are kind of down the middle. There's a lot of white space down the edges. Most of the movies are somewhere in the middle area because it just doesn't know. It doesn't really know what my likes and dislikes are because all I've told it is that I like Pretty Woman. I've given it no more information than that. Okay, so what we'll do now is we'll give it um, a little bit more information. So I'll watch another movie. and Say I watch Chicago. And let's suppose that I... I didn't like Chicago, okay? So I drag it across here. What you see happening is the movies are kind of spreading out now. You see more mm -hmm. movies down the, down the sides, ones it thinks that, uh, that I'll like, ones it thinks I won't like, not so many in the middle now. So that idea of um, a reduction in uncertainty when it sees new information, that's, mm. that's the view that we have of machine learning. That's what it means for the machine to learn something. Its uncertainty is reduced. So I'll just carry on a little bit, uh, a little bit more. Let's say, I don't know, I've watched uh, Ocean's 12. I liked that one. I watched Elf. I didn't like that one. And you see now, we see a very different picture. We see a lot of white space down the middle. Okay, there are a few movies it's not sure about, but lots of movies you know, it's pretty sure that I like them. These ones, it's pretty confident that I won't like them. So that's the idea of learning from data. I'll show you one more little thing. Yeah. So let's take a movie down here. Here's one that it's pretty sure that I like. Let's say I watch this and I do like it. Look what happens. Hardly anything. Hmm. Okay? It wasn't surprising. It thought I'd like the movie, and I did, so that's uh, unsurprising. If I take one down this side, and let's say I watch this movie, it's pretty confident that I won't like it, but let's say I do like it. Wow, we see a big change, yeah. okay? There was a lot more information because it was a lot more surprising to the system that I liked that movie. So that notion of uncertainty is really the, the mathematical basis for, for doing model-based machine learning. It's going to be really hard for me to rent movies from now on. It is. I'm going to read too much. I can't just pick one now that I know this exists. Mm. Uh, so this is obviously an example of practical application. I'm wondering about areas like healthcare. Right, so um, healthcare, I think, is a, is a potentially very big area for this because if we can move to a world where we have really good electronic health records, mm -hmm. where we have the, the health records of millions of people, and perhaps also with genetic information from those people, perhaps also with environmental information, that database could be enormous. We've already made a lot of advances in medicine from what we call epidemiology, from doing statistics on data of healthcare. But the, the modern digital world and the world of big data could allow us to do this on a completely unprecedented scale. So this could be, this could be mm -hmm. big as, as big as you know, antibiotics or x-rays in terms of the history of medicine. So I think there's a tremendous future in that, in that space. We're taking a little step uh, yeah. down that road. We're working with the University of Manchester on trying to understand uh, the factors which affect asthma and allergies in, in children. So mm -hmm. they have a, a data set of a, a couple of thousand children that they've been monitoring since birth over about the last 11 years. They're collecting all sorts of variables. What we've been doing is applying these kinds of techniques, these model-based machine learning techniques, as a, an alternative approach to the standard statistical methods that are, that are usually used in, in the medical field. So we're kind of looking under a different lamppost from everybody else, so we hope we'll find the keys first. Let's talk about that asthma work. Uh, I understand your research students, they're put through a bit of a ritual in their asthma work. 
Right, so a lot of, we have uh, research interns, they yeah. come in the summer for about three months. They're usually uh, PhDs um, in computer science, in machine learning. They're used to dealing with data, but for them, data is often a sort of a, a grid, you know, a, a, of, of numbers that they see on a, on a computer screen. And it's very important when you're doing machine learning, not just to treat the, the data as numbers, but to really understand where it comes from and what the sort of error processes and the noise processes are in the data. You really have to understand the domain. So, you know, the first thing we do with our interns when, when they arrive is we send them up to Manchester for a few days to understand the data. And what we do is we actually put them through the same sort of barrage of techniques that the little kids have to go through. So, for instance, they, they, they'll do a skin prick test. They have a whole um, array of needles put into their, into, the, into their arm, <laughs> and each needle has like a little bit of peanut or cat or dog uh -huh. uh, extract, as it were, to see which ones they're allergic to. Right. And we measure their lung function. We lock them up in a box and they breathe in and out. We measure the change of pressure and so on. On. So by the time they've been through all of this, they have a you know a lot of empathy for what the kids go through, and they understand you know that that little number in a table actually you know that maybe the average of 20 measurements taken from you know some poor child had to take the teddy bear into this box and go through all of this just so we can get that number. So they really learn to appreciate data. It almost sounds like hazing or in an initiation, but obviously there's a good reason behind <laughs> it, right? You didn't just decide why not. No, I think it's tremendously important, first of all, to understand the, you know, the value of data, right? the effort that it requires to get good, clean data. But also, once you understand where that data came from, you can understand that the data is not measuring directly the thing you want to know. So you might be measuring the change of air pressure in some chamber, and what you really want to know is the performance of the child's lung. You can't measure that thing directly. You make an indirect measurement. And modeling the difference between the thing you can measure and the thing you want to know is really at the heart of model-based machine learning. And by modeling that process, we hope to get much better results than if you just treat that measurement naively as if it were direct measurement of the thing you're interested in. Mm -hmm. I wonder if your intern applications are going to go down now that they know they've got to get pricked with needles first. I don't know. I think at the end of the day, they're